So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to session 16, um, titled Regional Responses to Security Threats, uh, Early Warning and Early Response. And our two speakers are online who have uh, joined us virtually, both of them. So since the beginning of the Emerging Security Sector Leaders Seminar, we have continually discussed the reality that the African continent is confronted by mega trends, persistent conflicts, and threats to security that are complex and wide ranging. They include a growing youth population, accelerating rates of urbanization, climate change, transnational organized crime, violent extremism, weak governance systems, exclusion of women and youth in decision-making and security processes. Against this background, early warning has become a critical component of the African peace and security architecture, APSA. APSA provides an, an opportunity for member states to display strong political will to develop con conflict prevention and resolution mechanisms uh, through the development of early warning systems. Early warning is the analysis and provision of timely, accurate, valid, reliable, and verifiable information and the formulation of strategic options, which are directed at decision makers and other end users so that they can take preventive action for the common good. Effective prevention requires the early identification of security risks. It requires security threat assessments and the design of mitigatory measures to be uh, implemented. Early warning will not be useful if it is not followed by early response. At the continental level, I'm glad tomorrow we are talking about the African Union. We have the continental early warning system, which was established in 2002. Uh, the AU continental early warning system is aligned with regional early warning systems, which also assist regional economic communities and they their member states to address issues of structural stability and root causes of conflict. The establishment of regional early warning systems is in line with the growing emphasis of both the AU, the United Nations on conflict prevention, which is epitomized by several frameworks, such as the UN African Union Framework for Enhanced Partnership in Peace and Security and the African Union's Agenda 2063. As building blocks of the African Union, regional economic communities are pivotal towards the, real, the realization of these visions. And they've evolved over time from being merely uh, institutions that were concerned with economic processes and regional integration to institutions that are vested in the pursuit of peace and security. So today, we really are humbled to have in our midst two speakers from uh, 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 two regional economic communities. One is ECOWAS and the second one is IGAD. They each have very elaborate early warning systems. So ECOWAS has what is called the ECOWAS Early Warning and Response Network, ECOWAS, which was launched in 2003. And then IGAD has the EGAD Conflict Early Warning and Response Mechanism, C1, which was launched in 2002. So more importantly, today's discussions will also uh, focus on how to effectively bridge the gap between early warning and early action, and how to transform early warning policy recommendations into early response and early actions by policymakers, by security leaders, and other end users. And to do this, I'm going to introduce our two speakers. Our first speaker is Mr. Kamlas Auma Omogo, also a friend of uh, the African uh, Center for Strategic Studies. He's the director of the EGAD uh, Conflict Early Warning and Response Mechanism since May 2016. Mr. Omogo has over 20 years of experience in the field, including as a peace building practitioner, a consultant. He has published chapters on peace and security, including publish, uh, participating in this very uh, seminar, uh, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, Emerging Security Sector Leaders a Seminar in Washington, DC. 
It serves on several boards, including the Eastern Africa Action Network on Small Arms, the International Action Network on Small Arms. He's also in the advisory panel uh, for the United Nations Program on Small Arms and Light Weapons. He holds a master's degree in international peace and security studies from the John Croc Institute for International Relations, uh, International Peace Studies, uh, and then from uh, University of no Notre Dame in the USA. He is uh, a Fulbright scholar. He holds a postgraduate diploma in project planning and management from the Catholic University of Eastern Africa and a BA in philosophy uh, from Ebeniana University in Rome. So it's going to be our first speaker. I'll give Mr. Kamlas uh, Oma 15 to 20 minutes, and then I'll come back to introduce our second speaker. Mr. Kamlas will respond to questions uh, related to the EGAD's early warning uh, mechanism. So Mr. Kamlas, uh, based on the uh, information uh, that is generated from the EGAD early warning systems, could you, uh, in your presentation, highlight what are some of the key security challenges and the drivers of these insecurities in the IGAD region? And then also try to uh, explain to us what are the uh, main roles of the IGAD C1 or the IGAD early warning uh, network? And how effective is this uh, early warning system in proactively anticipating security challenges? And then also, if you can, pre please provide some examples of how the IGAD early warning system has been used to anticipate, but also respond proactively to some of the conflicts within the region. Could you also in your response, share some of the key lessons from the IGAD experiences in order to help our emerging security leaders to improve on how they can engage in early warning and uh, uh, facilitate early response? Uh, good afternoon. Uh uh, everyone and Center for Strategic Studies for inviting me again, but today as a, a panelist um, uh, to share some insights, uh, uh, conflict early warning insights on the contemporary threat and security in the region. Um, as you've already uh, set the stage, uh, Martha, uh, our core business really is in uh, anticipatory analysis. Um, uh, so we are taking system, we complement member states' uh, efforts in anticipating uh, conflict and crisis uh, before they occur, and also in persuasively really inform the decision makers on possible minimize the, the, the impacts of a uh, conflict. So uh, basically, you find that work is within three areas, uh, uh, data collection and analysis, uh, then uh, presentation and briefing. Uh, so in uh, we have detection capabilities that helps us in uh, data capture and analysis, but also uh, capabilities in response. And this we, of course, uh, execute together with other EGAT programs. And I know within the, the participants, we have uh, uh, Commander Bebe, who is the uh, director of one of our programs. So we work together, but also we work jointly with other regional economic communities as well as uh, African Union, and I've heard that tomorrow you will be having engagement with them. So, um, so that I don't spend so much time on that, let me uh, share a few insights on uh, what we see as uh, the threats to peace and security in the Horn. Uh, I would like to start by saying that generally, the, uh, the Horn of Africa is uh, currently experiencing multiple and interwoven uh, crises. Of course, this differs from one country to the other, uh, but all the same, they are all uh, affected in, uh, in, this, in, in, in one way or the other. Uh, I know there are so many and there are myriad uh, threats to a crisis, but uh, I would like from our perspective to really uh, 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 summarize and really break them down into three main areas. And I would like to remain as strategic as I can, hoping that I will still be able to communicate. The first, uh, group of, uh, of, of, uh, of crisis the region faces relate uh, with the management of political transitions. The second relates with the governance and democratic gaps. And the third uh, relates to the institutional responses to the above two. 
And of course, this happens within uh, the context of uh, other extraterritorial uh, uh, influences, like uh, the current one being um, uh, uh, the conflict in Ukraine, and uh, the region is feeling the infra impact of, uh, of that conflict in, in many ways. So in the first uh, category of the issues, I will say that uh, virtually all countries in the Horn of Africa are experiencing uh, difficult political transitions. Uh, the extent, as I said, uh, differs from one country to the other, and therefore vulnerability also are felt differently. Um, but what we have learned over the time is uh, that uh, the pace at which things do deteriorate is very fast, and therefore uh, election become very important uh, to support the members and others to, to, to respond. Uh, so uh, within the transitional issues, I think I, I would like just to highlight a few areas that uh, are, are of importance to us. One is the desire. Uh, to find shared political consensus. And uh, in some cases, to change in the constitutional order, uh, but in worst cases, we have also seen cases where we have coups or attempted coup when the, 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 the shared political consensus is not forthcoming. Uh, other times uh, within the, the, pol the political transition, we see issues about uh, efforts to address uh, historical injustices the other is a, a desire to manage the economic and social uh, demands of changing uh, demographics. And we know that the youth bulge and, and how then the policies of governments are uh, relating with this is of, is of concern. But recently now we're also dealing with the issues of climate security and uh, its effect. Uh, and the, 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 the latest kid on the block, of course, is now dealing with the issues of, uh, of, uh, of uh, pandemic, especially COVID. We also have the pest that has also been ravaging the region. Uh, these are some of the highlights, but uh, they are actually, these transitional issues are linked and also with the governance and uh, demographic uh, distortions. Uh, and within this, I think uh, the key elements here is the election management and uh, center periphery uh, contestation. And so you will hear across the region, uh, either the contested elections, or you will hear also within this, um, uh, the, the periphery feeling marginalized and uh, seeking secession and, and the like. Uh, and so you see when the countries are now moving towards election, you start facing uh, uh, challenges uh, like I know the fever now that is in Kenya is like, you are not approaching elections uh, in a good way, but you are so much worried about the outcome of the election. The other aspects of this uh, um, uh, governance and democratic distortion is the uh, management and distribution of natural resources. And this often uh, transforms into competition that pits uh, different geographically based uh, identities, uh, ethnic or religious. So, depending on how the resources are being shared, they are those constitutions. Then it's about the utilization of natural resources. And this often actually uh, leads to intra and uh, in some cases cross-border conflicts. And uh, the situation becomes worse, especially when uh, uh, resources like the hydrocarbons are uh, discovered. So the, 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 the dynamics changes very fast. But lastly, uh, within uh, the third category of uh, the, 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 the issues that we, we see in the region is uh, that our institutions are not sufficiently responsive. Again, this depends from one country to the other. Some are weak, some are good, some are in between, but uh, how the institutions respond, respond to those two crises are also um, an issue. And within this, uh, we have several uh, institutions that are of concern. Uh, as I talked about the issue of election, then the first one that will come into mind is uh, judicial uh, um, uh, bodies and how, for example, they struggle to arbitrate um, uh, contested elections or to arbitrate between the different arms of government. We have the electoral bodies that are uh, hugely uh, suffering from uh, uh, trust deficit. Uh, parliaments are sometimes seen to be leaning towards the, 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 the executive in discharge of their duties. And of course, the other is about excesses of law in law in, uh, enforcement, of course, and other ministries. So basically, we have institutions that are struggling uh, to be able to deliver, but then they are not sufficient enough. And this, of course, uh, 
causes a lot of tensions uh, within the member states. But finally, and uh, uh, within this, also to mention that even regionally, uh, the, the key issue here is uh, the efforts to balance between uh, the sovereignty of member states as vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the need to uh, intervene. And this, of course, delays sometimes the response. So in a net, uh, the net, well, I would say that cumulatively, out of those three uh, uh, crises that I've mentioned, we then see the region facing uh, multiple violent conflicts, the issues around food insecurity, and IGAD now is actually having about 40 million plus that are food insecure. You face the issues of humanitarian emergencies, uh, uh, radicalized uh, groups, uh, uh, poverty and employment, and the cycle continues. And of course, within this context, also we find states also blaming each other. And when that happens, then even efforts uh, to bring the member states together to address pressing issues, it sometimes slowed down. Uh, and finally, is uh, the emergence of the use of uh, information technology, which of course we rely on even for our analysis. But then increasingly, the technology is becoming politicized, uh, sometimes being used uh, to widen the social divisions. And uh, our concern as the region is the extent to which now cybercrime is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is increasing and is feasting on the vulnerability of the uh, largely unemployed youth. So I have presented that portrait in terms of uh, uh, what we see as the challenges to peace and security, but that is one side of the story. The other side of the story is that uh, <clears throat> the regional governments as well as uh, regional bodies are actually actively engaging to address some of these challenges. And this includes a number of summits or uh, or, uh, or uh, council meetings or use of uh, good offices to try and resolve the conflicts in the region. Uh, there are bilateral arrangements, arrangements between member states to be able to address uh, uh, issues of bilateral nature. Uh, the region also moving towards an integrated uh, approach in terms of programming to address the multiplicity and connectivity of these uh, threats. So basically that is what I will present as uh, what we see as the challenges and uh, some of the responses that we see happening in the region. Which then now leads me to your second question that you are asking about uh, the early warning system. And I will not dwell so much about this one because you already uh, said uh, what system does. Now basically we are, implement we are complementing the member states efforts. But uh, in order to do that, uh, the mechanism was established as a multi actor and multi-layered uh, system. By that, I mean that uh, we, <clears throat> it's an open uh, source system, bottom up, and it includes a number of actors within it, and it acts at different levels. And uh, we have an analysis tool called the C1 Reporter, which has uh, indicators that help us to uh, monitor trends, events, and also do analysis. And we communicate our findings to uh, 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 to decision makers through our large briefs, et cetera. And the stakeholders are uh, widespread from the government, civil society, et cetera. In terms of uh, uh, effectiveness of these systems, uh, I want to say that we had actually to go through a process that we had to um, do a retrospective review to really see whether our early warning was being effective or not. And uh, what we did was we used historical data from 2003 through 2015, and we used that to test our uh, risk scores. And the outcome was, uh, was positive in that uh, our risk score were able to anticipate uh, uh, conflict outcomes. And again, we, we tried to use this by introducing the vegetation uh, data, and again, the outcome was good. Now, what we are doing is really to uh, uh, now bring it up to the wider variables uh, from five sectors in government, economy, uh, um, uh, governance, economy, environment, social and security. So we'll see again how this happens. But overall, I can say that for effectiveness of for such an early warning system, there are three critical areas. One is the ability of the system to track categorize and analyze large volumes of data, because now we're talking about multiplicity of conflict drivers. The second is about the network of, uh, of uh, responders. Who are your responders? At what levels are they? And how do you engage with them? And the third is uh, how closely 
are, is the linkage between uh, uh, the analyst and the owners, which is the gap between the early, the early warning and early response, which is now my next uh, point of uh, uh, intervention. Now, and I think this is the biggest uh, elephant in the room, but I will try to summarize uh, what we see as uh, uh, the challenges of bridging this gap. I'll present four of them in, in brief. One is actually to say that essentially uh, the, 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 the challenge between uh, of the gap of bridging the gap between early warning and early response is that one of the gap between analysts and decision makers. That's, that's actually it. We, we understand that uh, um, there is need to have professional uh, gap between the analyst and, 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 uh, and the decision makers. Yet, a healthy relationship between the two is very important, especially to address the issues of bidirectional spread of biases. If one of them is going to the other direction and of course blaming and everything. So that gap really is, is, is something that uh, if the analyst and decision makers are uh, wide, uh, sitting too much up, apart, then even the gap cannot be bridged. The second has to do with the structure that uh, some structures that really the early warning has to go through. You generate early warning, and uh, to the if the structure is very heavy, it leads to delays in, uh, in in action being undertaken. Now, in the business of anticipatory uh, analysis, uh, what happens is that if it is too early, is a problem. If it is too late, is a problem. So you have to always try to strike this balance so that you try to really get it right. Often not, uh, oftentimes, really, we, you may miss this and an action is taken out of what we'd call defective uh, early warning or an uh, action that come slightly later. And that start to create kind of a, a tension between the, the responders who have used the resources to be able to take uh, action and the analysis. So that starts also to create challenges for that gap to be bridged. Thirdly, is uh, about um, the analysis, analysis itself uh, on which the early warning is based. Again, if the analysis is not rigorous or if the sources are not credible enough, then the response decision makers will be very hesitant uh, to rely on the analysis that you are taking. And finally, is uh, what I already mentioned about the struggle uh, uh, on whether or not to intervene. So the early warning could be there, it could be timely, but should we or should we not intervene then becomes an, an issue. And that of course delays uh, early action. And sometimes now we find ourselves in, uh, in intervention mode. So I will be moving towards concluding uh, uh, by sharing with you what we really have, have learned uh, uh, in our 20 years of uh, existence as uh, EGAL's conflict early warning and response mechanism. And I will also want to pose this uh, to the participants really, because I know I'm speaking to uh, people who are really uh, in this field, basically. Uh, they are, I know a lot of you are actually already working in the field of early warning, uh, or you can call it intelligence, but it's the same. It's only that one of us, one part of us is dealing with open source, the other one is dealing with the covert means, but I think your professional is in your way. So the first lesson that I think <clears throat> is important to take home is the positioning of early warning system. And I would want to add strategically positioning early warning systems. So if the early warning system in such a way that uh, it cannot really undertake the strategic analysis that we now need, then the functionality of that early warning is going to be a problem. And in our case, we've realized, for example, we have national early warning units, which are not well placed. Some of them are placed in ministries that are inward looking, security concerns, so the sensitivity of the information. And that now makes other actors shy away from contributing. So, and, 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 and that is at the national level. At the regional level also, because now the early warning will be uh, getting information from across uh, sector, there's need really to uh, uh, elevate the early warning to a strategic position, early warning system to a strategic position. The second is related to the first one. It has to do with now that uh, the reality is that we are moving from more state-centric uh, 
uh, threats or security to people-centric. It means there we have uh, expanded the, the, the source of, of uh, conflict drivers. And when you do that, it means then that even your early warning system must be retooled. Uh, and, and I know across the board, because we do uh, cross-learning between other regs, including Echo One, that we have actually moved our early warning to this level, where now we collect uh, early warning indicators uh, from a wide variety of uh, sectors, uh, mainly, I think, the five that I've mentioned before. So that is important that you retool the early warning system to be able to align with the current challenges of peace and security. Third is about uh, response analysis. We've realized that for a long time we were doing uh, early warning and then we are giving uh, the warning and then action is taken, but we were never actually engaging in uh, analyzing what others would call the after action review. Really, really whether our early warning was adequate and if not, what can be rectified. But the beauty of also doing that is that it also creates a synergy between the warners and then the responders, because then now they will be sitting together and looking at, did we get it tight or did we miss it? And if we, if we did so... Uh, Lost um, our speaker because of connection from his side. All right, we'll come back to Mr. Kamlas uh, um, when his Wi-Fi reconnects back. Um, allow me at this time to uh, kind of uh, uh, share some key takeaways from uh, his uh, presentation. Back. Come, Lass, are you back? Yes, please conclude. Yes, yes I am. And one, more, one more lesson that I wanted to share, and the internet is uh, starting to misbehave, uh, is about uh, the peace funds. Um, but the English early warning uh, system uh, started implementing the peace fund, which we are calling the rapid response fund, as early as 2009. What that uh, allows us to do is to give them the flexibility to start supporting member state efforts to intervene urgently, even as other uh, longer term arrangements are being undertaken. For example, when the conflict in South Sudan started in 2013, this was one of the funds that we had used to start the processes going on. So um, we need really to support uh, the peace funds. And I know the AU is now having it. Uh, I, I visited the airports. And this is actually the way it goes. But the beauty of it is flexible to allow the responders, the responders to take quicker actions actually saves life a lot. And so I think that would be the last lesson that I wanted to share. And just to uh, conclude by saying that uh, investment to address the current complex uncertainties to threat to peace and security requires thinking and also positioning of early warning system. For me, I think that is the, 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 what I can hear. That we need to system and also how we position early warning system. And if that is done, we believe that uh, we'll be able to actually address some of the, uh, the challenges we are facing and we'll move more towards conflict prevention as opposed to uh, uh, intervention. I thank you. Thank you, Kamla. Uh, thank you for um, the nuggets of wisdom that you have just shared with us. Uh, you really highlighted the importance of uh, a strategic position of early warning, making sure that uh, when we are thinking about where to place our early warning infrastructure, we think more strategically on which institution is going to have the gravitas, but also more importantly, is going to have the coordinating capabilities to be able to uh, access the multi-faceted uh, nature of the information that we'll be getting so that all the security threats are covered. But you also highlighted the importance of uh, really tracking the impact of the early warning system through after action reviews, uh, as well as uh, through checking whether uh, there's any linkage between the early warning issued and the decisions taken uh, and the action taken. And then you also talked about the importance of investing in the, in, 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 through resources, directing resources to early warning infrastructures and processes. So we'll come back to that uh, during the discussion section. Allow me to uh, go ahead to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Gay uh, Abdu. He's the director of the ECOWAS Early Warning Directorate. 
uh, he has held this position since 2014. And uh, prior to this role, he was appointed by ECOWAS uh, in 2004 as the first permanent staff of the Political Affairs, Peace and Security Department, PAPS. Uh, he actually uh, was tasked to build the early warning system of ECOWAS. So by 2009, the system had been deemed as one of the most advanced uh, on the continent, and it became a reference for the AU and other regional economic communities. Before joining uh, ECOWAS, um, Dr. Abdul uh, was uh, working on uh, in the field of education uh, as a lecturer and as a consultant uh, in geography at the University of Ife in Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Gay holds a master's degree in geoinformation science and technology from the University of Twente, uh, the Netherlands, and he holds a doctorate in geographic information systems from uh, OAU IFE in Nigeria. So, uh, uh, Dr. Abdul, again, the same questions apply uh, to you, uh, now focusing on the ECOWAS experience. If you could also tell us about the security challenges and threats in the ECOWAS region, and maybe briefly touch on the drivers, and then to tell us about uh, the ECOWAS early warning and response network. Uh, also reflect on how effective the system is uh, in terms of anticipating and responding to the challenges within the F uh, West Africa region, and then also kindly share uh, examples if they are available, uh, challenges, and also recommendations going forward. Over to you, Dr. Abdu. Thank you uh, very much. You know that uh, ECOWAS, our community organization, uh, has existed since 2015. It is guided by the idea of mm, uh, having uh, the propulsion of the economic integration of member states. Uh, hello, excuse me. I think uh, I'm having a small issue with the translation which is coming up. Uh, I think I should cut it off. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Thank donc, you. Uh, <clears throat> vous savez, uh, donc je parlais de. So I was talking about ECOWAS, which um, is a type of representation that has been put in place to help the economic integration of these member states. And towards the end of the 1980s, we know what happened in our region with, of course, the conflicts, the civil war in Liberia and in Sierra Leone, and this led to the heads of states and the governments uh, through the 1993 treaty began to get involved in issues of peace and security, and it became, uh, uh, there was a question of establishing an observatory for peace and security in West Africa for the very first time. Another uh, document from ECOWAS in, in 1999, uh, this led to the protocol for the, uh, for, the, for the mechanism for the prevention of conflicts and the settlement of conflicts and peace and security. In 2001, there was an additional protocol on democracy and good governance. Now, to implement all of this, ECOWAS, uh, starting in 2001, it, it established an architecture of peace and security, and through this architecture, the president of the commission uh, received information from this early warning system, but this system is also supported by the Directorate of Political Affairs and Regional Affairs and Humanitarian Affairs, and so through the commissions that have been established, this enables the president President to try and establish some responses to these warnings, early warnings, and to do so, he has a committee of the general staff and the standby, ECOWAS standby force. 
and then other uh, entities of ECOWAS on, on one side, and then you have the Mediation and Security Council, and as well as the authority of the uh, heads of states and governments, that is now, after the 2000s, because when the protocol was set up in 1999, before us, we really had conflicts that were originated from issues with governance or armed conflict, but immediately new threats arose, uh, and, and they did not exist previously. So, you know, food, uh, insecurity, uh, conflicts between pastoralists and farmers, natural disasters, piracy in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, illegal mining, environmental degradation, pandemics, illegal migration, uh, human rights abuses, corruption, terrorism, violent extremism and many other types of conflicts within the region. Uh, and immediately, when the mechanism was set up in 2003, we set up a, a monitoring system. We have five monitors per country, and then except in Nigeria. So we have seven, except in Nigeria, because Nigeria is such a large country. Uh, so we have more. Now we, have, we collect and disseminate the information through what we call the reporting system, an event reporting system, um, or a system to report various situations through indicators. Currently, we have 56 indicators uh, in five thematic sectors. In 2007, when, uh, from when it was set up, the system to today, we have had over 100,000 um, items of data that were entered. So these are extremely important and they enable us to do very in-depth analyses. Now, in terms of the various themes, um, we have a, an approach that is based on data. And so we have five themes. First, crime, security, governance and human rights, and then health, and finally, in the environment topic. Now, in terms of the products from early morning, there is the daily uh, not reports, there's orientation the situation pays, reports, uh, guiding uh, memoranda per uh, country, and then incident reports, uh, security alerts, uh, early warning reports. Now, in terms of partnerships, we are uh, very much involved with civil society. Uh, one app particularly. So we have uh, one app um, monitoring people in the field who collect data in all ECOWAS countries. And we're also well connected with the uh, uh, con the continental early warning system of the African Union. We're currently deploying uh, an early warning system from the regional level to the national level. Now, we have also many development partners, and we're partnering also with think tanks uh, in terms of early warning systems. So now, we've had a lot of political support uh, from the member states, from ECOWAS, for the implementation of national centers within all our member states, because this allows us to decentralize this, uh, you know, and so there have been a, a, an increased efforts uh, to take into account women, uh, the, the issue of gender women, young women, girls, boys, the youth as well, in terms of human security. We've also had an increased recognition from uh, to involve traditional faith and natural leaders uh, to make it possible at the local, national, and regional levels to, to have them participate in this early warning system and in the responses. The eco warning system was upgraded recently with new tools, 
C'est un exercice and qui of est course, continue, this is an ongoing project. En matière de système d'information géographique, uh, so in terms of geographical information systems and they're able to simulate situations and to predict things beyond the early warning uh, to take into account other situations and other concerns. Je peux tout simplement j'essaie de vous montrer uh, so I'm trying to show you, you know, where in the, I have a diagram where I try to show the evolution of, of incidents, the changes, you know, and that have taken place in our region. In 2008, 2009, you can see that, you know, almost nothing was happening. In, in the ECOWAS region, but between 2010 and 2014, 15, 19, and 2020, 2022, you can see that despite all the efforts uh, set up by the mechanism and everything that is being done within our region, La région devient de plus en plus the region is becoming increasingly, uh, the situation is becoming increasingly difficult, and I want to explain this uh, as far as what we believe are the causes. Nous avons aussi un outil Recently, we also developed a tool that allows us to evaluate the risk and the vulnerability of various It's a new tool USAID that was, uh, we were helped by USAID to set this up and it enables us through studies to, and to go into the field to scientific research and to do evaluations of, of this research. And we're able to rank our states to classify them uh, depending on their level of vulnerability. And this will eventually result soon into a, a human security index for the ECOWAS region. And this will show the gaps that are there present within each country, along with providing recommendations to tell each member state how they can rectify these issues. And so therefore, we will contribute to the stability of our region. Now, what is the most important is how do we uh, fill the gap between the alert and the response? Now, in the ECOWAS region, there is uh, this issue this explosive demographic growth among the youth. And what we talk about, we call the syndrome of the street. We think that in terms of this, it's really a question you know, because say you call for protests in the street and hundreds of thousands of young people systematically will go down into the streets to protest. And this means that there is a real need for massive investment in the education of these young people. And that is the only way that we will be able to uh, fix this issue. Now, there is this dichotomy also between this concept of the nation and the state. You know, in Africa, we have a, a issue um, because the nations preceded the states. The states only exist really since the 1960s. But before that, you had nations. People believe in nations. Now, as I was saying a few weeks ago in Accra, during a seminar just like this one, in general, in Africa, that, uh, uh, in general, in Africa, we're not even interested in our constitution. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I never was interested in reading the constitution in, of my country uh, in the past. And this is really, you know, you see this out in the country, and this causes a lot of issues. Now, there's this issue of conflicts between the sovereignty of the states, the subsidiarity, and this idea of complementarity. And in, in West Africa, this is causing us a lot of problems. There are heads of states in West Africa 
Then, they are more focused on getting to a consensus for a given situation, rather, rather than using the data that is provided by the early warning systems to try and find solutions to these issues. So this is really a, a, an acute focus on political responses and a, a, a neglect of technical recommendations coming out of the early warning systems, and this poses, poses quite a lot of problems. That's our current situation, uh, you know, based what is, is going on. We have three countries, Guinea, Mali, and Burkina Faso, as you know, uh, where there have been coup d'etats, and you know that, you know, for heads of states, we, at early, the early warning system, we, we, you know, we think that if we had taken into account everything that was provided by the early warning system, uh, there would not have been these situations where people sought a third mandate and then, you know, does and everything that resulted from that. Now, another item that we want to think about today, the early warning and the response it, it must have a certain level of autonomy or even independence. You know, we're coming, we're, we're getting to the point where we can predict a lot of things. But the problem that we face is that is we're uh, having a problem with the sovereignty of the states. Now, a few months earlier, you, you see a situation that is sort of starting to take shape in a country. You bring them an early morning report. And when uh, the president of the ECOWAS Commission uh, tries to make it so that the state will do something to correct the situation, we are not allowed to intervene. You know, the states hide behind their sovereignty and prevent us from doing the work that we are supposed to do. Another issue is the, the issue of partnerships. You know what's happening in Mali. It's a catastrophe. A sovereign country where you have a certain number of you know, countries and organizations, because France you know, has its own strategy in Mali. The European Union has its strategy in Mali. The African Union has its own strategy. The US has a strategy in Mali. The Germans, the Chinese, uh, they all have a strategy in Mali. Mali itself has its own strategy, but it's not taken into account. ECOWAS has a strategy. So there, there are many, many strategies. So the, these are issues, questions uh, to which we must find answers to make it so that, you know, I think, so that we can resolve this situation in which West Africa is finding itself currently. We also need to rethink the regional defense mechanisms, the principles of subsidiarity and complementarity. Now, some example, at some time ago, the president of Guinea-Bissau, he was basically under fire. Uh, for, for four hours, he was under fire. But nothing, nothing happened. Everybody was somewhere waiting um, for someone to say, oh, he was hurt, or he was hurt. And then we'll start to do something. You know, we'll establish measures to condemn those who carried out uh, these attacks. But during the event itself, nothing happened at all. That means that our regional defense mechanism really is almost non-existent. So this is a whole set of questions that I listed here to allow you to see what the early warning system can do to close the gap between the early warning and the response. You know, and this is what I wanted to impart to you during this session, and I'll be here to answer your questions, and thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Abdul, uh, for that uh, analysis of the uh, security challenges within the ECOWAS region, uh, but also giving us an overview of the ECOWAS as an early warning uh, mechanism. Uh, you have highlighted some of the achievements uh, or um, the good uh, uh, practices uh, coming from the ECOWAS region, including the uh, uh, presence of uh, at least some political support fr from member states and uh, uh, heads of state, but also the collaboration with civil society organizations such as uh, ECO, uh, such as uh, WANEP, uh, and then also the ongoing efforts to kind of uh, uh, retool the ECO methodology uh, and the approaches. But obviously, uh, there are still some outstanding challenges that you have highlighted particularly the complexities when it comes to the principles of uh, subsidiarity, complementarity, and sovereignty, and also the limited political will to act even in the, in, in the presence of uh, evidence-based analysis. Uh, our leaders seemingly still tend to make political decisions that are not evidence-driven. Uh,